All right, I think we're gonna get going here. So good morning. I'm Howard Ratner, the Executive Director of Chorus. Welcome to the show, Us, the Data Conference, hosted by Coleridge Initiative and Chorus. Today's event is expected to run until 12 o'clock Eastern. We have a general interest and feedback survey running throughout today's event. The survey link can be found in the chat. I wanna give a many thanks to our generous project and conference sponsors. And also a reminder that we're using Zoom's webinar features. So I'm sort of sure many of you are already familiar with them, but just in case you're not, we encourage you to ask questions during today's sessions. And when you do, please use the Q&A button on the bottom of your Zoom screen rather than chat. Speakers will, will answer your questions either online or live. And I want to uh, for, welcome Suzette Kent. She's our first speaker and she will be doing the, the welcome. Suzette served as the US federal CIO from January 2018 to July 2020. Before taking the role of federal CIO, Suzette spent over 29 years in the financial services industry where she served as a principal at EY, a partner at Accenture, and managing director at JP Morgan. She currently advises public and private sector entities on digital transformation, automation, use of emerging technologies, and workforce development. Over to you, Suzette. Thank you, Howard. I'm Suzette Kent, and as I am so excited and honored to welcome everyone who's joined today for Coleridge Initiative's Show Us the Data Virtual Conference. Many of you attending today are familiar with the Coleridge Initiative, but for those of you who might be new to the efforts, just a, a, a quick background. Coleridge is a not-for-profit entity that was formed to help ensure that data are more effectively used for decision-making and for answering some of the most important questions of our time. And we achieved this goal in a few ways, by making data more usable, available and secure, we create new products and tools to support efforts across data, data ecosystems. We build networks and spark collaborations. Today is a great example of the, that, those collaborative discussions. And we use technology to break down barriers. In the most simple terms, we get a diverse informed team to the table and we ask, how might we? How might we solve problems differently? So thank you for being part of that today. The Col Coleridge and their partners then create a working solution. And that's what is exciting about today. When I served as the federal CIO, I saw this in action with the creation of the Administrative Data Research Facility. The challenge we had at that time was to find a secure way to share data, that, but that was easy to use and didn't require significant infrastructure investments. The ADRF was a great example of success using modern technology and a creative approach to enable data to be shared for research. And today, the ADRF has provided secure access to over 100 government data sets, 50 different agencies at all levels of government. It's FedRAMP certified and it won a 2018 Government Innovation Award. And thanks to all the Coleridge sponsors and collaborators, we don't just talk about the challenges, we create proven pathways to tackle them. So that's what today's session is about. So let's talk about today. Again, thank you all for being here. You're gonna see a lot of information. I'll remind you, we're gonna go through some of the topics fairly quickly. You can find additional detail on the Coleridge Initiatives website. So how many days, how many times do you actually start your day knowing that you're working on something that could change the world? That's what's exciting about today. Today is one of those days. This conference is about using federal data for public good. That might mean accelerating research, informing policy, driving economic value, serving the citizens of our country, or building resiliency. The Show Us the Data competition was actually the marriage of incredible capability. It brought together the power of technical intelligence natural language processing, and some brilliant algorithm builders with the curious and relentless quest of the research community to demonstrate to federal agencies what data are being used and how data were being used in a manner 
that was more comprehensive and quantifiable than anything we've done before. Creative thinkers using leading technology to search millions of publications brought clarity to the use of specific federal data sets for scientific research. Then they created a way to share what they learn with federal agency data leaders. And why? Why was it important that we did that and that we're in this conversation today? When federal agencies have clear connection to the use of data and the communities that are using that data, we can put the right focus on making data available, usable, and more effectively engage across these communities to improve our research outcomes. And that is actually how we solve the big problems and we change the world. I hope you're excited about today's conversation. And if we wouldn't mind, there we go. I'm gonna give you a fast run of show. The honorable former speaker of the house, Paul Ryan, is gonna share his views on the importance of data for informed policymaking. Our Coleridge CEO, author, brilliant economist and data guru, Julia Lane, will walk through specifics on the approach to the competition. A distinguished career professor in the machine learning department in school computer science and information systems and public policy at Carnegie Mellon, Ryad Gyani is gonna walk us through some highlights of the solutions with the winners of the Kaggle competition. Federal agencies are gonna share their dashboards and they're gonna comment about what learnings they drew from the results and, and what they could actually see. The chief scientist and managing director of science technology assessment and analytics team at the US government's GAO office, Tim Persons is gonna lead a conversation across the communities of publishers, researchers, academic institutions, and federal agency CDOs to connect their views about the value of these tools and talk about potential paths forward. And we're gonna end with a most important discussion concluding led by former chief statistician in the United States, chair of the Coleridge Science and Technology Advisory Board and my fellow co-sponsor of the Federal Data Strategy, Nancy Potok. And she's gonna lead the exploration of where we might go from here. What's next? So our goal today is to share results, connect communities, and inspire a meaningful set of next actions. So we're gonna pack a lot of information in a short time. Howard is gonna help keep us on time. And again, I'll remind you that many of the details are the things that we talked through on the Coleridge Initiative website. Thank you for being here and being part of the conversation. You're engaging today to listen and learn, and we want you to be a part of the path forward. It's now my honor to introduce the Honorable Paul Ryan to share his thoughts on the importance of evidence and data as a foundation to all that we do in government and research and how we build a better future. So thank you, Howard. I'll turn back over to you for our video. really nice to be with you and I appreciate this opportunity to address your conference albeit um, on Zoom. First, uh, I spent 20 years in Congress uh, working on um, a lot of economic issues. I spent five years before that uh, working in the field of economics as a staffer in think tanks and during my entire career um, I found myself always wanting more data and I found myself trying to quantify things. That's why I, I served as chairman of the Budget Committee and the Ways and Means Committee um, and I, as I looked through my career, what I realized was from working with agencies like CBO and OMB, um, data wasn't reaching its furthest extent. It wasn't going to where it needed to go. And as I also looked through my career, one of the issues that I felt that the federal government had an important responsibility that it was really falling short on was alleviating poverty, for example. And the federal government does so much in this space, uh, about a trillion dollars a year, almost 100 programs. And as we evaluated this and looked at all of the data, we were realizing that we weren't following evidence uh, that the federal government was more or less measuring its progress in, in, in an important issue like leaving poverty based on effort, based on input. 
How many programs are we creating? How much money are we spending on these programs? And not measuring it based on results and outcomes or following the best results, funding what worked and not funding what didn't work and moving those precious dollars to things that did work. That wasn't happening in government, in Congress, in the 20, 20th century, in the beginning of the 21st century. And so I basically decided to take on um, the challenge, and this was probably midway through my career, to try and find a way of, of depoliticizing and taking the ideology out of these fights that we had. That's the one other point I would make is, as I went into this space, I tried reforming lots of programs. I found myself in just an ideological partisan battle almost every step of the way to try and make things different or better. Uh, and so what I realized was the one thing that's really as unassailable as it gets in politics today is facts, evidence, science, data. And so that is what led me uh, down this path from speaking with a number of economists and then teaming up with my buddy, Petty Murray, uh, totally on the other side of the aisle, but a good friend of mine nonetheless, um, to try and have a, a way of sorting this out. Could we get the federal government to really use its data and disseminate its data so that partners, partners in academia, partners in the private sector, partners in the vendor community, and the government agencies themselves could pursue data and evidence. And where would that take us? Would that make our government work better? Would we be able to achieve the results we want to achieve? And could we move down the path of making things work better, of better fulfilling our goals and our missions and our visions without these hardcore ideological and partisan battles? And that is why we chose the Evidence Act. That's why Patty and I did a commission and then passed the bill to the Evidence Act. And now I'm really excited about sort of the version 2.0, execution. Where do we go from here? How do we deploy this? How do we make it work so that we can really better effectuate policy? I, I saw a couple of glimpses of the promise of this. Um, I was in Manning, South Carolina earlier this year, visiting for the fourth or fifth time a program that I'm really enamored with called Nurse Family Partnerships. And Nurse Family Partnerships is a program that's been around for a while, funded through the McPhee program. And it's one of those few programs that the federal government has been using data and evidence on, where a, a nurse visits a new uh, a first time mother, with inexperienced mother to help make sure that that mom is really prepared for motherhood, prenatal, postnatal, and, and, and the results are amazing. Six to one cost benefit ratio, $63,000 improvement to society in benefits because of this nurse family partnership program. And what, what was, this program, politically speaking, it started with Bush, it got expanded with Obama, and renewed with Trump. These are three very different presidents, very different administrations. But the one thing this program had in common, it had unassailable data and evidence that showed what works. So I sort of saw that particular program as a window into a very positive future, where we use data and evidence with the private sector, with the academic sector, with colleges and universities and philanthropies and foundations and for-profits and the governments, and we really effectuate policy to the point where now we can use you know, natural language processing and machine learning to really move the needle on this. And that is where this conference comes in handy. That is where the work that you're doing, those of you who are attending this conference, the, the Kegel um, Award recipients, that is the promise that you have for all of us who've been really hoping for this, planning for this, pushing for this for a long time. So I just wanted to say that I think um, we can leapfrog the stalemate. We can bypass uh, all the unproductive ideological and partisan gridlock we have and make government work move the needle on the missions that we all want in society. We want poverty to be alleviated. We want upper mobility. We want to solve problems that society has. And nowhere is this better made clear than if we follow evidence and data. So much of it is collected, but we need the tools and the capabilities to not just understand what's being collected, but empower people to find um, unassailable, unbiased, objective truth and facts and science and data and evidence so that we can really move the needle and solve problems. That is where I think we are right now. 
we are moving well into the era of not just coming up with an idea, not just passing a piece of legislation, but now actually putting the, the idea in practice, effectuating change, moving the needle, and making society, not just government, but making society work, making academic academia work, and just building a casca cascade of virtuous, a positive loop. I really think the virtuous cycle of using evidence and data is going to help us move the needle so far on these programs. And so I just want to uh, commend you in the conference, the Kegel recipients, and thank you for doing what you're doing because you're, you're showing the promise that these ideas have had all along. Thank you and have a great conference. So um, next up, we've got uh, Julia Lane. Uh, Julia is co-founder of the Coal Ridge uh, Initiative and, a, oops, sorry, and a, and a, and a provostial fellow at NYU. She is the author or editor of 12 books and over 80 scientific articles. So Julia, over to you. Thank you so very much. And um, a, a heartfelt thanks to everyone uh, who's attending and, um, and the presenters. So if you'd go to the next slide. So uh, what we're talking about today is uh, thinking about how to identify how data are used in um, to produce information and evidence. And as um, Speaker Ryan has pointed out, the importance of data and evidence can make an enormous difference to policy, uh, understanding how and where to allocate resources. And in fact, it's a very key part of the um, Evidence Act. Uh, agencies have been uh, asked to provide information about how their data are being used and to publish it on the website and to work with the public in expanding the use of public data assets. Now, here's the challenge. There's a gap between how data are being used in science and indeed in the, in the public arena and our understanding or our knowledge of how they're being used. So there is a gap between uh, how they're used and how, what we know about how they're used. So the purpose of this conference and the, and the Kaggle competition and so on is to close that gap. So how are we going to do that? Now, we have been here before. There was an Open Data Act uh, in uh, 2009, and the agencies were mandated to put data out. Now, I'm an economist. Econ 101, if you create mandates, uh, what ends up happening is that, for example, if you have a nail factory uh, and you tell uh, a factory under a communist system to produce nails and you give them a volume quota, you get one big nail. If you have a quantity quota, you get thousands of little nails. What you have to do is you have to create an incentive structure that enables uh, the market to some extent to respond. And that's what we're trying to do here. So if you take a look at the next slide. So rather than having a um, mandate that forces agencies to put data out, which doesn't provide information about use, the idea here, the core idea behind show us the data is to create an ecosystem. And the ecosystem is to create an incentive structure. So the first thing is we need to find data sets in publications. By and large, uh, people who work in evidence don't cite the data sets, whether they're a government agency or a scientist or it's a um, it's media, they don't cite them. If we can find the data sets and show how they're used, we're going to be able to show what the topics are, who the authors are, and we're going to be able to build that ecosystem. And then we're going to be able to document the value of the data set. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk you through uh, what that process is, how the Kaggle competition works, and we're going to see how three agencies, NSF, Commerce, NOAA, 
and uh, USDA, ERS, have actually taken some of those ideas and shown how to show the value of the data. And you'll see how uh, then we're going to have the stakeholders discuss how they can get credit so that we create a self-reinforcing mechanism, if you like, an Amazon.com for data. Next slide. So the good news is the plumbing is in place. Uh, there has been an enormous um, transformation over the past uh, five to 10 years in our ability to track data, to create unique identifiers. We have the interest of, the, uh, of Congress in modernizing data infrastructure, federal CDO council, the publishers have done a fantastic job of uh, curating and documenting publications. Uh, and there are a lot of industry groups who are interested. So the plumbing is in place. Next slide. Now what we need to do is to find how data sets are used. That's the gap. We know that data sets are being used in empirical research, but the information isn't there. If you take a look at this example, which is part of the um, uh, data sets that we put out in the Kaggle competition, these researchers identify that they use a NOAA data set, the SLOSH uh, data, but they don't cite it in their references. It's not discoverable. So the Kaggle competition said to the data science community, can you find data sets that have not been cited, but described in the publicly recognized in their publications can you go and find it from the way in which they referenced it? So a human being looking at this says, oh, they're using slosh. Can the computer figure it out? So that was the challenge. Next slide. So working with the agencies, USDA, NOAA, um, uh, uh, NSF, and uh, funding from the uh, conference sponsors, we challenged data scientists to see if they could read thousands of publications and find, search and discover and close that gap between uh, the data that are cited and the data that we know are cited. We had over 1600 data science teams work on it. And you're gonna be hearing about the three uh, winners uh, shortly. Next slide. Uh, and they're listed on the website. All their information is um, the information about what they did and the models are open source and publicly available. Next slide. And so here's what's amazing about what they did. So uh, you can see on this uh, formatted information, this is a NOAA data set on the reporting of tsunamis. In column D, you can see the title of the publication. And our team went through and labeled them. So you can see that inside this publication, in the text, there was a reference to the data set that was used. And it's the DART data set. What was amazing is the uh, models which are reported in F, G, H, I, and so on, they were able to find that data set from the semantic context and able to name it. So the point is, we don't need to rely, at least initially, on people citing it in references. The machine learning models are able to go in and extract information about what researchers have publicly acknowledged in their um, in their uh, in the text of their document. Next slide. So what that's going to enable us to do is to close the gap. Once you have the data set to publication dyad, you then have uh, information. Again, this is public uh, information about the topics, the research topics that have been studied using the data for every publication, uh, the authors, the journals, and uh, uh, and all the information that, again, the publishers have developed and curated in conjunction with the researchers and the academic institutions over time. That means you can build an API. Once you've got an API that captures that metadata, you can produce tools that 
agencies can use to automatically produce inventories and information about the use of their data. Again, you're going to hear from uh, some of these tools uh, described by the agencies shortly. Uh, you're going to hear what uh, how NOAA has used the data, uh, push pulled in very simply into a Tableau dashboard. Almost all agencies use Tableau. They can just pipe the data and customize the Tableau uh, information as they wish. You'll also hear another example from USDA about how they pulled in the data into a word cloud and, and get the understanding of that. NSF uh, used a very uh, powerful but relatively low cost tool, uh, which is called Click, that uh, took them 20 to 30 hours to build. So low cost, low burden information that's available. Next slide. Now, of course, you don't want that happening behind closed doors. You want an open and transparent process. Part of what the Evidence Act uh, requires agencies to be is to be open and transparent and to engage the community in identifying the, the value of, of the data assets. So the important role of the stakeholders, and you'll hear from them later on, the researchers, the academic institutions, and the publishers, is how can we engage with the community to get them to correct uh, information that was generated by the model, how to improve our understanding of the access to and the use of the data, and uh, build human computer interaction tools. And uh, SJ Klein pointed out to us very early on that um, if you put something up that's incorrect, you'll find lots of people uh, uh, fixing it. And so building that ecosystem that relies on the agencies putting information out, researchers correcting, because obviously they're going to want to uh, get their attribution right, just like the way they do with publications, is going to be an important element. So what you're seeing today is an attempt to build that ecosystem. If you want to be part of that, uh, you can uh, join us, uh, fill out the survey form that we're going to put on the website and as well we're going to put it in the chat and you can become part of that conversation well beyond this conference. Next slide. The incredible thing and the timing of this conference could not have been better in many ways uh, that the Federal Chief Data Officer Council which is one of the key um, parts of this ecosystem has just issued an RFI uh, which has asked for public inputs on methods and tools that improve government's efforts to better generate uh, and share data, including data inventories. You'll hear from Dan Morgan uh, later on uh, in the session as well. But we can provide uh, ideas and suggestions, again, as Paul Ryan said, so that we can have a better understanding of how data are used for what. Next slide. So the point is, we can do this. This is not an abstract notion. It is like moving from a manual ad hoc system to an automated incentivized data infrastructure. In some sense, it is like building an amazon.com for data. Before Amazon, we used to physically go down to the bookstore and ask people uh, about books and topics by engaging the community in um, providing information about how books are used. Uh, same thing with Airbnb uh, and uh, Yelp. So many uh, platforms in the modern day get input from the community. That's what we need to do here. What the Kaggle competition has shown is we can do this. It's a long way to go yet. The fact that the agencies are engaged and interested is heartwarming. And we very much look forward to that continued engagement. So thank you, Howard. So next, thank you, Julia. Next up is Raid Ghani. He's gonna be presenting the winning methods from the Kaggle competition. Raid is a distinguished career professor in the machine learning department in the School of Computer Science and the Heinz College of Information Systems and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University. He's a co-founder of EdgeFlip, an analytics startup that grew out of the Obama 2012 campaign 
focused on social media products for nonprofits, ad ad advocacy groups, and charities. Over to you, Raid. Thank you, Edward. Um, do you want me to share my screen or do you have the slides? I can do either. Um, okay. Um, um, yeah, is, can I control the slides or do you have to do that? I'll, I'll do it for you. Okay, but there's a lot of animation, so. Yep, yep uh, we got you. Okay, got it. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, th this is, this is, you know, none of the work I'm going to talk about is, is, is mine. So it's very easy to one talk about it to uh, uh, take no credit or blame for it. So um, basically the, uh, my job here is to sort of describe to you what a little bit more about the competition that, that Julia just mentioned uh, that, that took place on Kaggle and then um, some of the winning methods, what did they do? What were some of the key insights behind them and, um, and how did they build the system that, that's sort of starting this whole thing? So. Next slide, just as a recap, um, you know, the goal, as we just talked about, was show, you know, the, the larger level goal was how publicly funded data are being used to serve science and, and society. And then the, the, the starting point, the initial task that this type of competition focused on was, um, can we identify mentions of data sets within scientific publications? And I say data set codes because you know, some data resources we think of as data sets, some we don't. Uh, and, and that definition is pretty fuzzy depending on who's asking for it. Um, and I think that's gonna be a, a, a recurring um, thing in the next few minutes as I talk about, you know, a lot of these things are, are subjective um, and more context specific, which highlights the, the further need for not doing this manually over and over and over again and having a, a scalable approach to doing it. So. In general, the, the idea behind the competition was um, taking you know, tens of thousands of, of you know, thousands of publications and um, manually looking at them and, and getting um, some mentions of, the, of data sets in there. Um, that was kind of the starting point. And then the competition was, we'll give you these, um, you build a system um, that we will then test on unseen publications. So we'll give you new publications that you haven't seen um, or you know, even the same publications which haven't been completely tagged and ask you to, to, to give us uh, the, the data sets that are mentioned in there. Um, and the way we're gonna evaluate it, um, and that's really important is, you know, as Julia was saying, incentives, if you tell people to build, to extract all of them, well, one thing people could do is say, every word is a data set. And if they did that, they will capture every data set that's mentioned, but it's completely useless because they've given you every word as a data set. So you can actually, it's not, you know, in, in the in machine learning statistical terms, it has full coverage or recall uh, or sensitive, you know, but it's not very precise, it's not very correct, it's just giving you everything. Or you could do the opposite. You could take the one data set that you know exists, maybe it's the American Community Survey, and say that's a data set. Well, yes, you're correct, but you've missed everything else. And so what these, um, contestants for this competition were given, were given a metric to say, we wanna make sure that it both, it has coverage, but it also doesn't give us irrelevant words or, or things that are not data sets with a larger focus on making sure that we don't get irrelevant things. Um, and that's something that it's again, very task specific. What do you wanna do with it? Uh, very much defines what, what happens, uh, what kinds of systems you wanna build. So that's the background. Yeah, um, next slide, please. Um, here are the three sort of winners um, of, of the competition. Um, I'm going to start describing quickly approaches starting from the third place person, Mikhail Akhipov. So if you start from, from the side, basically what, what he did was instead of having the machine learn things, he said, I am better than the machine. So how about I learn what types of things end up looking like data sets, what types of words and phrases end up um, um, being described as data sets. And, and I'm going to, instead of training the machine, just tell the machine what to do. So we basically, he took the data and he learned himself what the patterns were. And so his first thought was, oh, if I see a set of capitalized sequences of words um, that have this sort of pattern, some word, some word, some word, and a specific word followed by parentheses, I think that's a um, uh, uh, um, are going to be a data set mentioned. Um, if you click on the next slide, 
And so, for example, you know, when he did that, he found, uh, well, you know, you get these three three things on the left, um, you know, high school longitudinal study, but it misses a bunch of other things. Um, and you notice here, the bunch of other things there have words like and and dashes and for in the middle. So next slide, please. Um, he added a bunch of those things. Like, oh, how about I insert prepositions and brackets and hyphens? Um, next slide. And so then he found, well, okay, I match all the things I was missing before, but I'm now ma ma matching a bunch of other things that are not true, like type one, type two in the US and the UK. Um, so then he said, next slide, please. Um, I'm going to remove, um, I'm going to create some of these words that, that trigger a data set. Next slide. Um, and then I'm going to also remove certain words um, that if they exist, then it's not a data set. So next, next slide, please. So he basically got to the point where he said, you know, if they contain the word study, survey, assessment, then call it a data set. If they, if they contain the words lab and center and consortium, and if they don't really occur together with the word data, then get rid of it. Um, and that's kind of what his final final um, entry was uh, is. And if you notice what he did was, you know, he spent a lot of time looking at how people describe data sets in actual publications. And then he went to an iterative approach and he sort of came up with a pattern, came up with a hypothesis, tested it, refined it, tested it, refined it, very much like, you know, what we do for a lot of problems. Um, and he got to some place that's pretty decent in this case. Um, so if you go to the next slide, the second team um, took a similar starting point but but a different um, approach. So they started with pretty much the same idea. Next slide. Um, it says, let me find the same patterns pretty much that match these data set mentions. Um, so it's going to be these words that are capitalized and, and, and a parentheses. But then after that, instead of going through all the gymnastics, <laughs> um, they said, now I'm going to build a machine learning model. So next slide, please. That's going to take those candidates from the first hypothesis and classify them into, is it a mention of a data set or not? So the same starting point, but instead of going through all those hoops, he said, I'm going to train a machine learning model. I'm going to give it examples of data sets and not data sets and ask it, is this phrase that I just got, is this look like a data set or not? And underneath it is all the same gymnastics going on, except it's the machine learning algorithms that are able to distinguish that. So it makes it a little bit easier and a little bit more scalable. Um, once he classifies that, next slide, please. He then says, you know, if it's a too common of a name, get rid of it. Um, and if just the first part or the acronym, the full name of the acronym appears, tag them as data sets name as well. So kind of learn what's happening from the full name and then propagate it using any subset of it, either the full name or the abbreviation. And that's what sort of, that's the, that's the answer. That's the entry that, that he submitted and did really well. The winners, if you go to the, the next slide, um, they said, um, if we want to apply machine learning, we need a lot of what's called training data. We need lots of instances of data sets being mentioned. And that's expensive right? because people have to go through thousands of publications and highlight manually what the data set mentions are. That's contextual, it's difficult, it's expensive. And so with its competition, um, the team did a few of them, but it was you know a thousand or so. Not, not a, a few hundred. And the reason the other teams couldn't apply pure machine learning was because it needed a lot more of those things. And so what this team said is, well, we only have a few examples of data sets, but the key insight was, let's not worry about how a data set is mentioned, what the data set name is or words are. Let's look at how people, what context people mention data sets in. So anytime we see the phrase, we use data from blah, that blah is most likely a data set. Or if they mention data were obtained from blah, that's gonna be most likely a data set. So what they were able to do is say, let's not worry about what a data set name looks like or a mention looks like. Let's figure out all the contexts in which people describe data sets. Um, and that was sort of the key insight. The second thing they did was that, well, even then we may not have enough data to train a robust system. So one of the things they did was thought, let's take things that look like data sets, um, but weren't given to us, weren't tagged manually, and just remove them from the data so it doesn't confuse the system. The system sees two things that are actually data sets and, and says, this is this is that this is not, then it's gonna get confused. So, so they sort of manually filtered, helped the machine learning system not to get confused. And the third thing they did was they said, 
you know what, we're going to create variations in the data. So if we see a data, a, a name of a data set, we're going to change the case randomly. We're going to remove a last word of that just to give the machine learning method more, more data, more variations to work with. And what they were able to do was take all of these things and put them together. That was the, the winner of the competition. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so basically, you know, the, the summary, you know, everybody realized that this, this, this competition, the task was not one of these off the shelf things where you, you pick a tool, you pick a method, you apply it and you're done. They all realized that they had to really understand what the problem was, um, what the use case was, and more importantly, what the metric of interest was. Because the use case defined the metric that we care much more about um, when we say something is a data set name, we want to be right about it, possibly at the expense of missing mentions. Now that's not a universal use case. You might have other use cases where you're trying to be more comprehensive. You might have a use case where you don't care about getting everything right, but you want to make sure that you're getting an equitable coverage about data sets that impact different types of geographies or different types of communities and different types of people, in which case, every mention is not equal. You want to sort of, you know, get to certain use cases. So they had to kind of think about that, look at the data and create something really custom. And if you notice the solutions they built, they range from um, a, a person looking at all the data and coming up with these patterns and doing reasonably well to a person starting with that, but then augmenting with machine learning, um, doing better to, really understanding kind of the right combination of what are people really good at and what are machines really good at and putting that all together um, through heuristics and machine learning to, 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 do, kind of to, to win this competition, right? So kind of to end really, like I think these kinds of efforts um, need this collaboration. It's not, you know, a computer scientist sitting in a corner on a computer. It's not um, somebody who understands how publications are written, reading them manually in a corner and highlighting them because neither of them really get to the right answer. So this is a really good way to put those people together um, with a very real world problem and the incentive to create solutions that actually work. Um, so looking forward to more efforts like this and, and people working together. Well, thank you, Raid. Uh, very interesting, really interesting. So we are pleased to have representatives from the USDA, NOAA and NSF here today. Uh, we're going to start off with Spiro Stefanou. Spiro is the administrator of the Economic Research Service. Since 2015, Dr. Stefanou was a professor of economics in the Food and Resource uh, Economics Department at the University of Florida. I'm going to read actually all of their uh, bios here first because we're just going to go through them one after another. But he's going to be followed by Thomas Beach. Thomas is the interim um, chief data officer at the Department of Commerce. Thomas leads the department's data governance activities, executes key data collection, inventory and quality processes, and provides strategic direction and guidance for the Bureau's collection, storage, use, and access for their data assets across 12 bureaus or offices. Thomas chairs the department's Commerce Data Governance Board and leads implementation of the federal data strategy and represents the department on the new federal CDO council. Then after that, we'll have the NSF representatives. So we have Dorothy, Dorothy uh, Aronson. She is the NSF's chief information officer. She is the principal advisor to the agency's director and other senior management on all matters involving information technology. And then Vip, Vipin Aurora is the deputy division director of the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics at NSF. So over to you, Spiro. Thank you very much, Howard. Uh, well, we're, we enthusiastically partnered with the Coolridge Initiative to start taking the first steps towards assessing how our work promotes understanding and creates knowledge. Now, a case in point is the ERS work on the rural urban continuum codes. If we can get that slide up. Okay, so it's a word cloud here. Um, this is a classification scheme that distinguishes metropolitan counties by population size of their metro area and non-metropolitan counties by degree of urbanization and adjacency to a metro area. Sounds like a basic geography attribute. Now let's take a look at this word cloud. Uh, now in resulting from this, our natural language processing competition. Uh, let's quickly glance at uh, the health related themes here. And I'll tell you, this is something that was a bit of a surprise to us. 
And let's see the connections of how diversity, equity, and inclusion intersect with health. So let's go to the first one. Uh, the first one I'd like to point out is disparity. And so when we hit disparity, we start to see a number of, of uh, publications here related to healthcare access, related to diversity, related to equity, health insurance, uh, a, number of, a number of different topics. You know, we think that these rural urban continuum codes are really gonna help with rural healthcare delivery perhaps, and some poverty related themes, but we're finding quite a few other access uh, themes here. Uh, let's hit the uh, rural areas. Uh, rural areas here shows the widening rural urban disparities in life expectancy, occurrence of conotruncal uh, birth defects in Texas, you know, in the comparison of urban and rural classifications. Uh, we can go to another word, uh, low income. Uh, and here we see fathers and mothers, cognitive stimulation and early play with toddlers. Uh, we see access to hearing health care, geographical residency, quality of life with adults with hearing loss, patterns and predictors of child care subsidies for children with and without special needs. Uh, another word, health status. Uh, again, a number of structural issues related to poverty, structural model of early indicators of school readiness among children of poverty, investigating trends in rural health care outcomes, uh, transient but not persistent adult food insecurity influences toddler development. So these are a range of themes that come up. And if we, if we had looked at the Google Scholar citation of this this uh, urban, uh, rural urban continuum codes, we wouldn't we'd find much fewer than 100 citations. And this competition, it's found there are thousands and thousands of uses, especially in, in when we start looking at uh, health related themes and healthcare and, and other dimensions. Uh, there are two other data products that were used and they, in this competition, one is the ARMS, the Agricultural Resource Management Survey. And the second one is Food Apps, the Food Acquisition and Purchase Survey. And here are a couple of links and uh, my colleagues have, have a short little uh, video kind of describing how the tools that were developed in the competition have value to us. So the, what I'd like to kind of emphasize here is these tools, as Julia mentioned, are starting to help us find the gaps. So when you find the gaps, the next step is challenge is to close the gap. So what we're looking to do is create a culture to close the gap. Crowdsourcing knowledge about data investments is one of them. Thinking of who our communities are. You know, we think of communities in a geographic space. We need to start thinking of them as our partner agencies. Commodity associations start to loom large, given, for example, the emerging drought conditions that may persist in the face of climate change. How are rice farmers going to start looking at our data products in the arms data product? Uh, rice is a very water intensive uh, commodity. We look at what's the role of access to produce this evidence. We have academicians involved. We have researchers, out, researchers outside the academy. How do they help us close these gaps? We're looking to leverage the creation of an ecosystem. That was, uh, that was mentioned by Julia, our colleague Imelda Rivers at the National Center for Science and Engineering St uh, Statistics uh, is very fond of using the same concept. You know, that's what we're building here. And we're trying to find how extension this system can be. And the ecosystem is a great analogy because diversity is a measure of stability. When you start thinking of ec in ecological terms, how diverse can we make this group? So we're hitting an evolving frontier here. Uh, we applied this tool to a handful of key data resources. At the Economic Research Service, we have over 80 data products that are publicly facing. And then we have another set that are uh, non-publicly available. We 
restrict the use, but we do make them available with memoranda of agreement. We're looking to expand, build out communities in terms of research, in terms of agencies at all levels, and in its availability, the scope of stakeholders, just beyond the journals to looking at the business press, other government agencies, the congressional record. We're looking to expand to other data and other uses. Uh, we have researcher portals being developed and in use right now and looking to expand those. And it's about investing in people, models, and data with our publishers. And so thank you very much for the opportunity to present this. And now I'll I will turn it over to Thomas Beach. Thanks, Biro. And uh, I'm going to try to share my screen here, if that's all right, Howard. Go ahead. Great. Thank you so much, folks. Um, I appreciate the time here to, 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 to discuss this. And again, I'm the interim CDO, uh, Chief Data Officer at the Department of Commerce. And it'd be important to talk about um, the richness at, at Commerce of our missions. We have Census Bureau, we have a lot of economic analysis and um, economic development, minority business development agency. We have trade, we have the US Patent and Trademark Office, uh, NTIS. Uh, standards and um, uh, of course NOAA, which we'll talk about a little bit. And it's important here to know that the richness of our missions because it was brought up earlier, we don't always know how the data is going to be recognized. Um, so there is no standard for that. So certainly in a world where we have multifaceted missions of bureaus and offices, there's no standard across that as well. So, um, and I'm glad uh, Spiro, you mentioned uh, value because this is part of the discussions and, and, and progress that we're making at Commerce. And certainly what, what NOAA has done as part of this engagement drives towards this uh, understanding value as we understand not just our inventory, but who's using and how's, how is it being used. So uh, we recently uh, published our commerce data strategy. I think it's worth uh, taking a look at if, if you have a chance at commerce.gov uh, under data and reports. And in our, in our commerce data strategy, we're really focused on really understanding this type of problem. So these types of engagements that the Coolridge and others are putting together are fantastic ways to unlock this, this discussion around value and sort of pull back the curtain of who's using data to understand the value of, of, of our data. Um, you know, certainly as America's data agencies, we like to talk about commerce. We, you know, we really like to um, show the fact that you know, we, we are doing this and, and, and we're, we're, we're focused and we're doubling down on it. So I'll transition over into the example of work um, that NOAA did. And I wanna thank the team um, NOAA for um, uh, the good work that they contributed to this process. And we look forward to the next phases of sort of doubling down on these, these, these opportunities and looking at how we can improve the model, improve the data set and the quality of the data set because discoverability is a really, really important component to understanding inventory and use of data. So here's an example sort of going at NOAA sort of how we get to the, the, the sea lake uh, overland surges or effectively known as slosh data. And this is sort of how one might arrive to, to know what to figure out, okay, this might be a data set. This is something that may be of use. And, and I'll transition over to what, what was mentioned earlier, sort of what was the result of this effort and through the use of this natural language and uh, machine learning process, we're able to kind of create these um, dashboards and interactive ways to really look at the information that's extracted in a really unique way and not just point to a data set and expect somebody with a PhD to understand that's the correct data set. I mean, well, this is all about democratizing access and understanding of data. So when I choose to go here and look at sort of the journals, something I might be interested in as a user, and this is really designed to be a part of a user community, not just for researchers, but for all, right? And we care about community resilience, you know, as we talk discussions about mitigation drives resilience um, when it comes to uh, weather data and, and sort of organizations and localities and, 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 and frankly communities that are um, affected disproportionately by uh, certain weather events and, and resilience is, is what we're trying to um, improve and, and through that we look at mitigation. So this is really cool. This is a way to look at here are the related data sets. Um, here are the journals that go along with it. Um, and it's sort of ready access, not just to the data set, but for the rich contextual information that goes around a particular um, data.
data set, right? And so this is sort of looking at the node and, and next node and, 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 and how do we see, okay, a data set's being used here and there, and maybe it's of interest in these different journals. And, and certainly, you know, from my perspective, you know, having these concepts be topical here and not so specific to um, the jargon of a data set allows discoverability also to be improved because these are topically based. These are easy to understand concepts. So it's pretty exciting to go here, take a look at this um, and understand, okay, this might be information I really need. You know, if I'm looking at, you know, hurricane damage on the Gulf Coast, because that's a real of, of interest right now, you know, I quickly have access to these links, to these sites, to this information, and it allows me to sort of discover in a rich way what the data sets are being used for and how. Um, and, and again, I, this is, for us, it's, it's key and it aligns to, to commerce's uh, data strategy around understanding inventory. And, and I like the point about value of data sets. And so this is cool. It's another way to visualize the information um, in another way in Tableau, sort of how and how much and where it's happening. So um, these are all really cool outputs of something like this engagement. I, I, I know it's very exciting that you know, the, the sort of coding side of this thing happens, but it, these are not just sort of single points in time. These are really sort of rich three-dimensional ways to say discoverability means this and not just uh, in a single sort of a point uh, to, of discoverability. So um, again, you know, and lastly, I'll, I'll, I'll be sort of brief here, but it's very exciting work. Uh, we look forward to, to the next iteration of this process. We look forward to talking about use cases you know, opportunities, you know, for me, it's really exciting from a federal side to really say, okay, how does this really pull in and engage the state and local governments? Because at the end of the day, that's who's really being affected. So, you know, um, what's really cool is another component is this thing called the scorecard, right? And the scorecard itself is really, as this was mentioned earlier, the ecosystem, right? How do I give feedback? How do I give, you know, under, understand the citations? And this is really sort of the public side, um, the of of engagement and i get super excited about this because this is the push and pull with with the public right this is how do we get better at doing what we do how do we provide uh, this information and, and and usable um and, and equitable access but also how do we move this illustrious needle forward with with sort of the crowd with the, with the, with the folks that use our data um and within this process since it's a a, a give and take we're able to better understand um, the value of, of this process by understanding who is who and how our data is being used. So I really thank the opportunity to share today. The commerce is very excited about where this is going to go. And um, I'd like to, 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 to hand it back over. Um, and, and I thank you again for your time. Well, thank you. Know, you. Know, thank you, uh, Tom. NSL. Thanks. Yeah. So next. Next up, we've got NSF. Hi there. My name is Dorothy Aronson, and I am uh, the CIO of NSF, but I also wear a few other hats. And one of the uh, wonderful uh, headgear that I wear is the chief data officer for the agency. And through that work, um, I've learned uh, that, well, let me go back one step. So National Science Foundation is uh, you know, we, we fund research throughout the U.S. and um, we also use data to fuel our decision making about which um, science to be uh, uh, investigating. And within the National Science Foundation, there's a beautiful agency called the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics. And so uh, we host uh, that, that agency and I'm going to turn the the mic over now to uh, Vipin, who's the deputy in that organization, to show you how we used your data. Thanks so much, Dorothy. If we can go one more slide, just for those of you who don't know us, um, one more slide, please, Howard. Uh, if you could come check out, I, I encourage you to check out our, our brand new website, and it's going to tell you all about um, you know, all, it's got all the information, the gold standard of information on science and engineering. So I encourage you to, to, to have a look at that uh, when you get a chance. And I really appreciate Dorothy uh, kind of leading off. But Julia, you did kind of put me in a tough spot here. Not only do I follow Dorothy, uh, but also Tom and then Spiro. So I'll just point that out that it's unfair. 
but I'll I'll continue on here. So let me uh, let me uh, if you don't mind, Howard, I'm going to share uh, my screen uh, and uh, and jump into the dashboard because I, I think that's what everybody uh, wants to see. And as uh, Julia mentioned, when we came up, it's it's uh, developed in something called Click. I want to thank our team. Uh, at NCSES, also working with the Kohler's team who, who put these things together. Remember, you saw a little bit snapshot of the underlying spreadsheet that kind of feeds this. I'll make two caveats before I, before I jump in. Uh, the, first, uh, it, the first is that, you know, this is, this is, you know, I would consider preliminary information. We shouldn't use it to make any inferences. But I view that actually as, as a good thing because that means we're getting something out in front of you early. Uh, you know, at NCSES and NSF, we think a lot about innovation. We think of ourselves, rightly or wrongly, as innovators, right? Uh, and so I think that's what we're trying to do here is, is build something is build something new. So, yeah, again, uh, it's preliminary, uh, no inferences, but also it's exciting that, that we're here in front of you uh, to talk about it. Uh, and so I'm just going to take you through it so you can kind of see what our team was able to do, which, you know, I, I personally was very impressed with. Um, starting with the word cloud up here in terms of topics. I mean, how cool is that? That bam, right, right off the top, you can see some, you know, some, some kind of key topics that that jump out: affirmative action, female scientists, entrepreneurial. That really kind of, when I saw that, jumped out to me. Uh, to the right of that, you can see the, the associated titles and links to the articles uh, with that. I can, you know, I can scroll down, and we've got a map, and you can see where the the publications are coming from. In terms of the countries, you've got affiliations, uh, and over to the right, you've got data sets themselves. I, I, that, to me, another thing that just kind of stood out, and I'll come back to that hopefully uh, if I don't go over my time. Um, authors, another word cloud with authors and, and subject areas. Uh, and then um, as you keep going down, I, this, this row is really, for me, was really good because I, I, I really like time series. And to be able to see it by year was was really cool. I thought. Um, and then, what are the what are the data sets that are used alongside NCSES information? Uh, again, really really nice to be able to see. We've got a tree map. If that's you know that's kind of your flavor, uh, you can look at that. Uh, and then you can come down here, and there's more detail in terms of authors, number of publications, affiliations, and titles. Right. I'm going through this quickly. I apologize for that. I'm going to scroll back up. And just demonstrate one thing, and that is um, that this it's a dynamic dashboard, as it kind of Thomas and Spiros both were too, they, they showed. I'd like to scroll under data sets. Uh, so, you know, we can pick a data set, and I'll pick uh, our National Survey of College Graduates, uh, the NSCG, and I'll just click on it, and then you'll see dynamically the entire, uh, the entire dashboard. Will update, and you can kind of see how the word cloud updates, and now affirmative action kind of stands out. Uh, you can the titles and articles, and everything kind of updated uh, with that, uh, including the publications by country and author. So I'm gonna I'll, I'll stop the demo there. Just want to thank everyone involved in this effort. I thought it was great. I think our team, like I said, had some fun with this, uh, and hopefully this is uh, this is something that we can develop and 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 will be useful to people as we develop it further. So Howard, back over to you, and thanks very much. Okay, great. Uh, so our next session is the reactions from stakeholders. This will be moderated by Tim Persons. Uh, Dr. Persons is the GAO's chief scientist and one of the two managing directors the Science Technology Assessment and Analytics Team. Prior to joining GAO in July of 2008, he served in key executive roles at the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity and the National Security Agency. So over to you. Thanks, Howard. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right, great. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, appreciate that kind introduction, Howard. And really thanks to uh, Julia and Suzette and Nancy for uh, coming to call and talk about data. This is an incredible time to really uh, do what Speaker Ryan was talking about, is unlocking the value of the massive amount of data that has been derived 
uh, over a, a significant period of time and, and then extracting uh, solutions and, and forging solutions defined by problems that then allow us to drive to uh, you know, evidence-based solutions in the way that uh, the speaker was talking about. So I would just say ditto to him and ditto to the conference thus far. It's been uh, fantastic and it's fantastic to be here. We have a very important panel that we're, we're turning to, uh, and I want to uh, jump to them quickly. But all I want to say is that uh, from uh, the GAO perspective, what, what we're doing is we are also, as an agency, being Congress's uh, main oversight arm is uh, and being a steward of, of, of data over our now century of life uh, is extracting that value as well for the good of of supporting Congress in, in executing its Article One uh, responsibilities of oversight, so it's a it's a time where I think the um, the best days are ahead of us in terms of what we can do. I think it's transformative in terms of how we think about uh, data driven and analytics driven uh, uh, government services, which is largely uh, what a lot of the government has become, and we have to think in a services uh, type manner. And I think data is going to drive that kind of process. And so for that reason, uh, I established a, uh, with, with the Comptroller General, we established a um, innovation lab within GAO that, uh, and I hired our first chief data scientist, and we created a space to be able to have problem-driven, uh, a, a high expectation at times rate of failure, but useful failure, uh, something that, of course, is not incentivized normally, but with data and asking questions, we can uh, come up with solutions, and we have done that. We at GA have done several dashboards already. One has been internal on just COVID risk management throughout the pandemic that, uh, that uh, my team put together in two weeks and used external data to do things. Um, and it's been very powerful in terms of just us as an agency managing risk. But also, as we look at things like uh, the improper payments problem and payment integrity, we're building a payment integrity dashboard that's going to be coming out. Uh, and, and one that is public that we did do uh, earlier in the pandemic was on Operation Warp Speed, just tracking the, the vaccine. It was able to scrape data from the NIH, and we've had success ourselves in terms of doing that. So I'll put that in the chat, but I really do want to turn now uh, to Dan and talk about uh, just one of our kickoff uh, as our panelists to talk about the CDO perspective, both at the uh, Department of Transportation and then at uh, how what he's seeing on the CDO Council. Uh, and I think uh, the beginning question is, what are you seeing in terms of the, the challenges right now in the federal agency? Maybe speak to the DOT story and then also uh, what that what you might be hearing from um, uh, the uh, the other CDOs. And then the key thing is, what can we do about it, right? I, I have uh, some approach I'm doing at GAO, but there's that doesn't mean it's it's a one size fits all thing. I'm sorry, there's I'm sure there's some uh, good approaches that uh, you're seeing as well. So Dan, why don't you kick us off on the panel and tell us about what you're what you're hearing? Over to you. Sure. Thanks, Tim. Um, really excited to be here, everybody today. So, you know, as we uh, had a discussion session amongst uh, a couple of CDOs and a couple of other Evidence Act officials about the this this incredible work that, that Coleridge and, and, and the team have been leading, you know, we really think that um, CDOs are still sort of finding their way inside agencies. Um, some of them still have multiple hats and aren't dedicated uh, in terms of you know being a full-time CD person that's working on data issues. So we do experience a little bit of resource competition, um, which then drives the need for partnership, right? Um, so being able to bring this tool to bear inside one of our larger, you know, federal science agencies like Commerce, and I'm so glad that Tom was here to tell you um, what they've learned from this project. I think, you know, being able to find the right resources and find the right stakeholders to build that coalition of the willing is a is a big piece of it. Um, and then I think the other thing is it's not exactly clear um, what kinds of skills we might need um, to use and maintain these tools. I, we certainly love open source and, and we wanna be able to take advantage of those kinds of tools, but I think it's important for us to help communicate to agencies what kinds of skills they need to be able to pick up and run with these tools that, 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 we're, that we're building here. I think to, to be able to commit resources and direct agency attention to, um, to, to, to really overcome those, that friction we really need to build some specific use cases to help agencies find the right sponsors and then 
take up the mantle of trying one of these things out, right? And we want to help them design for learning, right? So we want to learn like what it takes to turn on turn on a tool like uh, like the ones that we built here, um, and figure out what it takes for agencies to set the right priority, allocate the right workforce resources, overcome any IT or other kinds of barriers, and how they stay engaged with the customers of the products uh, along the way. I think an important thing for us as a as a CDO community was. Um, this wasn't really just about inventory for us. I think we sort of zoomed out and said, you know, this also just helps us prioritize our work, right? When we see data sets being used a lot in research, um, we want to help focus our resources on maybe we need to do a better job of making it publicly available or take some friction out of the system. Or maybe we need to go ahead and make improvements to what we're making available today. So being able to observe the use uh, in research is extremely useful for us in terms of being able to communicate value of priority. And the other thing is, you know, we want to talk to data users, right? So we actually, I think, have an opportunity through this process to start to build meaningful exchanges between data users and data providers so that we can, uh, so that we can make roadmaps for improvement and be relevant to our customers. So that's the initial stuff. Um, and I think one of the other things I want to do is sort of, there's another slide in here. I want to plug that the CDO Council is thinking about inventories right now. We have an RFI on the street. Um, so uh, we encourage you to check it out and uh, respond because all of you are very, very smart and we need the perspectives of smart people to help us think about how inventories can truly serve uh, a higher purpose uh, than just being a catalog on the web, but really helping agencies find and manage data uh, more effectively. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, uh, let me uh, just pivot and also just pulling in because it's this is a cross sectoral. Uh, this is a team sport in a cross sectoral way, right? Government has to uh, shift uh, at times where appropriate, right? There are federal statutes to follow, and Dan knows as well the CDOs. Um, you know, you can't throw everything out there, but there there does need to be, uh, I think, a cultural shift from need to know into responsibility to provide where appropriate. OK, so I think with that, then we really are shifting into uh, I wanted to uh, ask um, uh, Kay Husband's feeling if she had any uh, reaction to this from the researcher perspective. And the reason for that is because um, uh, Kay and I were actually talking last week, Kay sits on on my uh, Polaris Council, it's a it's a science and technology leadership entity, and really just uh, I think Kay advises us, and she's saying uh, rightly, you know, what can we do to 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 enhance equities in terms of just GAO's work, but the government work in general. And for my part, I see a huge. We've already seen some examples today from dashboards about equities related things. Data is coming out. We have just members last week saying we need to get more data out. So there's a lot of enthusiasm about this. I want to just ask Kay, uh, thank you, uh, first of all, for all the work that you do in your leadership. But what's the researcher perspective on the usage of, of data sets? What can we do to help you do your job better? Thank you, Tim. And it was good to be with you last week. And so happy to talk right now about what researchers can gain from this tool and the broader platform quite a bit. And I want to go through and talk about what we heard from researchers as they responded to a few questions um, that Coleridge put to them. But just to note on what you just said, you know, um, Speaker uh, Ryan did mention, you know, the need to alleviate poverty. He did mention the importance of upward mobility. And these actions really do speak to all of us, not just certain segments of our economy or of our country. And having the evidence and the data to move the needle, as he said, is critically important. And for me, in my research even, I care a lot about the small end problem. And Julia and others have been able to look at the data and try to probe the data to get to a point where we can even have the evidence behind those issues. But let me say a little bit about what generally we found from the researchers that responded to a series of questions when asked how they might use the tool to advance their research. Um, one key area was to have incentives for researchers 
um, that facilitate success and encourage use. So for example, better literature searches, clearly. Finding knowledge, knowledge users. So I want to work on a particular project and you can use this tool to probe to find who else is working on similar or adjacent issues so that we may be able to use those data to help solve the problems that we're trying to work through. Understanding better use cases, and that came up quite a bit already in our conversation, that the use cases will be um, just e more easily discovered using the tool that, that you saw um, just a few minutes ago um, from the agencies and what we've been talking about all along. Find a trusting da trusted data. Uh, for me, especially, as I said, finding data that on the small end problem and issues regarding equity, very important. And I'll give you an example, um, another type of example that we heard from the researchers. The tool can assure that the burden is not only on the researchers to provide their publication data, but rather a positive feedback loop could be created by researchers having their citations and publications included getting people to advertise their work, giving seminars and sharing their data and best practices in terms of citing data so that their work can be acknowledged throughout uh, in the literature, acknowledged by the agencies and, and so on. Um, this also could lead to improvements such as a uniform citation of the data. Um, researchers were also interested to find out, you know, how would the tool um, advance the work of early career researchers while gaining base visibility by their own work being cited and, and taken up with in other ways. They may be able to look at the data that they're using, um, find mentors and role models within the system as well. Um, so it's about building community um, and, and that's an important building a community of data users and this tool will facilitate that. Making connections that highlight um, sometimes what is underused, not only the very, you know, the data that are often used and the linkages that are often made between data sets or among data sets, but also discovering what could be used much more to answer some of these questions that we have. So these partnerships between the academy um, and so you researchers, um, academic researchers, government agencies, that really will be an important piece. And that's what we heard from the researchers. Another aspect of that also is that we expect to see improvements in data sets and accuracy and usability. I just wanna say a few more things before I wrap, um, wrap up here. Uh, when they were asked about how the tool may inspire researchers to do work differently, um, that was interesting because the, it, it kind of framed around the idea of intersectional data, the, the intersectionality of, you know, bringing data sets together that we typically um, would not if I were just in a, you know, I'm, I'm an IO economist and maybe um, I'm working on a project that actually has huge ramifications in, in the data, in the literature, in labor, and I'm now able to use this tool to pull things together that I normally wouldn't. Or if I'm used to looking mainly at data published in journals, uh, which is primarily where we're going for our research, but there may be reports put out by the GAO and others where um, those data can be pulled in as well. So that intersectionality of the data, really important. And I think that that's one of the things that this tool allows us to do. Um, I just want to say a, a couple of more things here that the researchers also understood that as they're developing data, sharing data, this, this iterative process goes on, the agencies are also able to take what they're doing at, in the research realm and say, well, here's the ROI, here's the return on investment of the data that we're producing at, in our agencies. And maybe that gives them the fodder for funding and further development of the data system that we have. So I just want to summarize to say exactly what you see here on the slide. The reaction from the researchers that 
We need incentives for the researchers that facilitate success and encourages use. And this is what the tool does. It, it does incentivize that, right? Um, there are connections between what data sets are being used and for what purpose. The use cases will be very clear within this um, platform, within this tool. We need to allow researchers to build on what's already been done. And that's not just for the early career researchers, but also if you're pivoting to do something new, that is a great resource um, for, for that purpose as well. And the last point here is interactive partnership approach between agencies and a research community really is amplified. And, it, it, and there's a, a security with which the data are used and really and, and a, a reliability with which the data are used. And these use cases really could inform what the agencies need to say that, you know, return on investment. This is what it means to invest in data. This is what it means to have a robust data system. So Tim, that, that, those are my um, uh, takeaways from what the researchers are saying. Yeah, thanks, Kay. And you reminded me of one of our other internal dashboards. I think we previewed this to you last week, but just for everyone's knowledge is, is doing what you're saying. Like we're just trying to feed information into uh, the congressional process in a real time basis. So we have a tool that's web scraping on all these committee websites. So when a hearing comes up on topic X, we're matchmaking that topic with our report. And even if GAO isn't in the hearing, uh, even if uh, the, the committee aren't asking us questions, we're just saying, look, we're just trying to proactively push to you. Here's the work we've already done. And so it, it's very powerful and we're, we're very excited about that. But uh, it's right in line, Kay, with what you were saying. Let me turn, to, just because, yeah, thanks, thanks, Kay. Um, let me turn to the, uh, academic uh, institutions, there's, there's uh, in addition to the need, of course, for uh, the, the researchers themselves, and I think Kay outlined a compelling need, and I'm very excited for the research community, it's also an institutional perspective. And so uh, Judy Russell from University of Florida is going to uh, tell us what she found uh, from the questions that she was, she was doing. So Judy, over to you. Looked like she was on a little okay. while back, so I hope we didn't lose you, Judy. Are are I'm you? I'm here. I'm waiting for my video to start. It says I can't start it. That the host has to start it. Can you okay. hear me? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. So if you want to start talking, sure. Um, let me do that. All right. Now he's saying start my video. All right. So um, we participated in uh, one of Julia's workshops and, and very much enjoyed it. A uh, number of us were librarians. And so we were representing kind of how we support the whole research and academic enterprise. Um, I'm very struck by the things that have already been said and not surprising. Um, the things that Kay has talked about were very much echoed with our group. We were very uh, excited by this opportunity um, to have improved discovery of what data sets exist and are available and how they've already been used um, and how this might help us identify opportunities for collaboration across disciplines. Um, there was a real sense that um, improving the metadata and, and beginning to develop citations um, would be very helpful, but that this is an amazing step forward in identifying these data sets in publications. We obviously at the institutional level would love to know how our authors fit into the, the uh, areas that are being explored by these data sets. We're always interested in understanding that. Um, there was um, a very real sense also that looking to the future, granting that we are just dealing with this right now, that um, we would really like to see the inclusion of data beyond the scientific publications. So there's certainly government documents like the ones Tom just mentioned, conference papers, and other material that we call gray literature that would also be using this data and could very much become a part of this and raise the visibility and access to those materials as a source of information for uh, researchers and others who are applying the information. Um, we did have a concern uh, about the accuracy of data, the protection of it. I think Kay mentioned trust, uncovering bias. I think we've all been very conscious that as we do more with data, we have to be ever conscious of those issues and how 
our systems help us address those particular issues. Um, we also were asked about how we felt about whether there should be a central host for this type of information. And there was uh, generally a favorable view of that, but also a recognition that um, academic institutions and some of the agencies would probably want to host specific search and display capabilities. You've seen some of the demonstrations of the dashboards that are already being developed. And so um, having tools and a system that allows both some central management and sharing, but also the flexibility to let uh, individual institutions um, respond to the, the needs that may be specific to them, but at the same time in the process, contribute even better access to others who may turn to them for that source of information. Um, I think like the agencies, we really do very much want to understand the usage by our own researchers and we want to improve their discovery and access so they get the right data sets and the best data sets for the work that they're doing. And um, not only the idea of including additional gray literature, but at some point in the future, also looking at how we could expand this to include state data and data that we generate ourselves at our own institutions. So we looked at it and saw this as being a first and a very, very important giant step, but a step that um, opens up at some point to a, a much broader array of data that could be brought together and managed in this way. And um, we, as Kay indicated too, and I think as Dan Morgan did, um, saw a real interest as part of this development in finding ways to collaborate with you as you work forward in these processes. So I think having academic institutions, having researchers, as data users who are part of this process and, and providing feedback on the tools would be very important. And particularly those of us in land grant universities often have very close relationships with federal agencies such as USDA and NOAA and could easily see ourselves participating in pilot projects with you to test some of these tools and, and help improve the usability of them. Um, so we were, um, very pleased to learn more about the Coal Ridge Initiative and about the things that are being done by the agencies and really see this as something that our institutions would very much want to participate in and would benefit from. Thanks very much, Judy. I appreciate that. And um, I, it's, it's so important to have that overarching institutional uh, system. So it's not just individual researchers. We just have that overall umbrella. Uh, from that and have that strong collaboration that, uh, that, that you're uh, thinking of or presenting here. So thank you. Um, it, from a publishing perspective, uh, it's great that um, we wanted to pull the publishers in. And so Alex Vance is here from AIP Publishing and uh, she can give us a reaction from what the publishers are saying about this. Um, and I think it goes to the, the idea about not only a finished product, but data uh, and things like that as well. So uh, Alex, uh, over to you. Sure, Tim, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. I'm Alex Vance. Uh, as the slide notes, I'm CEO of AIP Publishing. I'm also chair of the board of directors of Chorus. So participating um, in that vein as well. We held a publisher workshop in late October on the 20th. And this slide mentions a few of the key takeaways, but I will also summarize from our notes. Um, and, and a lot of this will echo what you've heard from Judy and from other speakers today. So I think the first point was that there was a real emphasis on sustainable infrastructure, of course, um, and the value of producing a high quality curated corpus. So that is always um, important for this community of users. And so that we can continue to explore knowing that we're working from a, a stable and consistent um, base of high quality content. There was a sentiment that there should be a central place, um, as Judy mentioned, such as data.gov where the information can be accessed. I also really take um, Judy's point in the point of the institutions that there may be more specialized applications and locations. One of the biggest challenges with reusing and understanding the ongoing value of data sets is, you know, we still don't really understand how much metadata 
um, there is available. And that's, that poses a challenge. We want to have more context around the data. So getting sort of our minds and arms around that will be useful. Um, as others have mentioned, the incentives for authors to comply um, will also be really important. Um, this group, the publishing group, also was interested in bias. There was a sentiment um, echoing an, an earlier comment that it shouldn't just be a machine learning process, that machine learning and human interaction with transparency would, uh, would ultimately generate less bias and greater trust. There were two main use cases um, that, that were emphasized, and one is a compliance-driven use case, and one is a discovery-driven um, use case. In addition, per the third bullet, um, it was felt that you know, a link back to the article DOI and therefore the publisher is, is critical. It really helps us ultimately build an informal citation network, which is one of, I think, the community and collective aims. Further, there was a sense that, of course, yes, public and private partnerships um, will be really fundamental to this effort. And um, an emphasis that we wanted to be quite friendly to international partners and users, and also be resilient to US government administrative change. Um, so that will be something to note. And finally, I think, you know, not everyone would be cognizant. Of course, the span of publishers that would participate would really vary greatly from commercial to society to all sorts and sizes. So, so we did want to raise the fact that, that, you know, smaller publishers will be really important contributors to this initiative, but there will be need for additional enabling for them to sort of, you know, be able to gain entry to the system and participate in the most constructive way. So I think that pretty much summarizes our feedback. I think like the institutions, the publishers are quite eager. This is a really important space for us to explore and it feels important to do it collectively. Um, having the opportunity to work this way with you through Chorus has been um, a great first step and that's a helpful way for us all to get together in this effort. Thanks Thank so much. You. Thanks, Alex. And it reminds me of, uh, this is exciting uh, as well from the publishing perspective, but it reminds me that we are moving toward that national research cloud is the idea of putting things up. I remember uh, years ago, the chair of house science was asking me and saying, why are we in, in all of our grants, you know, keep paying for infrastructural things? What if we just had a uh, a, a, a large cloud-based structure so that we could not only have the researchers do the compute that way, uh, but they also, the data could be shared. It fits right in line with this overall messaging. And so it's exciting to see that as sort of a, a, an infra data as infrastructure, but also the computational infrastructure being pursued. Um, regrettably, we're out of time. I feel like we could talk about so many things here. Thank you to the panelists. Uh, at this point, uh, it's time for the audience to engage. So I was going to hand it off to uh, Nancy uh, to pick up from here. Thank you. So actually, uh, Julia and I are going to- uh, Oh, great, thank you. Hand off this, this audience discussion. So we now invite our audience to discuss what you've heard today. Um, Julia and I are gonna moderate any questions that we have seen either in the chat or the QA. QA window. So by all means, start filling up that QA window um, because uh, that's where we're going to get your feed from. So Julia, do you want to um, kick off the first question? Yes, so we got a lot of comments in the chat. Um, we're probably not going to be able to answer them all in the short time. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll curate the responses, we'll post them on the website. Uh, we put information on the uh, you can fill out a, a, a survey to have your name and email address so we can contact you um, with additional information if you need. Um, there were a, a, a whole bunch of really interesting comments. Let me pick on a couple of them. There was one question about can the machine learning models pick on whether a data set has been mentioned or used? Right. So you could say, my goodness, I used food apps and it was the best data set ever. And this is how I used it. But I didn't use uh, no name data set because it's a piece of junk. But 
you know, if a, in a simple model, you would pick up both food apps and no name data set as having been named. Now, you will notice that in Raid's uh, discussion about the different types of machine learning models, uh, they were able to pick up from the uh, semantic context a couple of the approaches picked up from the semantic context, whether it was used or just mentioned. Uh, clearly, one of the next steps on this is to um, uh, expand our understanding about how uh, the sentiment uh, and the way in which the data are being used. We did not make that the explicit task because we were just interested in, could this even be done? So um, that, that's the answer, answer to that question. Uh, there were a couple of comments about um, the uh, state data and accessing data privacy. I suspect that the concern there is that uh, because of data privacy laws, uh, uh, confidential data are underused relative to public use data. And uh, there was an appeal to use uh, to modernize data privacy laws. I think that's a, a, a valid uh, issue. There was another comment about, and, and then I'll stop and see if anyone from the panel wants to jump in. Will a future enhancement uh, ca capture data, for example, on unemployment that does not use the current population survey? And I found that was a very, very profound question because what it goes to is the heart of this conversation, which is finding data sets that people are using to answer questions that are not, were not previously known. So if we look at topics across the federal agencies and we find out that, oh my goodness, some enterprising um, researcher or government analyst or state analyst has gone out and has started to try and use, for example, wage record data or unemployment insurance claims to get new measures of unemployment and employment that could complement the current population survey in our understanding of uh, unemployment. That would be another way in which um, the, this uh, collaboration between researchers, government analysts, and the, and the data officers could, could um, be augmented. Uh, let me stop and see if uh, other of the panelists have something to add to, to those. I have a whole bunch of other questions, but I wanted to see what others said. Suzette. Well, Julia wasn't necessarily adding to that. I was, I was picking up very quickly on two of the other open questions. There was one question around how does this align to efforts around federal data privacy and data sharing laws? Um, and, and that's a that's a great question. You know that that shows that uh, recognizes how important the policy and law is uh, side by side with the work efforts. And there there are you know other efforts um, in those spaces. And as we talk about use cases um, at the end of this discussion and this this conference. That's one of the most important areas where we drive real results to inform updates, enhancements, and changes and behaviors for what we want to see in federal privacy and data sharing, because these are new spaces. So, so they're very important connected conversations. That's part of the reason, you know, Tim and, and other uh, team members have been part of the conversation. And then the second one I, I think was that, that I picked up on was a good takeaway was the connection to grants um, and grant IDs and research. And there is some separate examination of modernizing of the grants process. Um, and that gives us another channel to, to go back and share the results from this work and ask the question again, how might we? Julia, I'm, I, I see some more questions come in and I'll let you yeah, pick up there was on. There was a great question about can we have DOIs for data sets um, and can we get researchers to reference, uh, put data sets in the references. There is a big push. I know USDA has been pushing hard on this ERS to create DOIs for their data set. And uh, that's the point of the plumbing being in place. 
the, uh, Howard's been very much in the lead of this conversation as well, Chorus, with data site and so on. The, um, the basic idea here is you can you know, bring a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. So you create the DOIs, but then you need to create the incentives for researchers to cite it in the references. So if the agencies are able to pull that information up easily, you create a leaderboard on your website of the top users of the data set and enable the researchers or the government agencies, uh, researchers to put that uh, on their CVs or on their performance reviews, you would see massive increases in use. You don't see any reluctance in researchers uh, talking about their publications. The whole idea of making data sets a first class asset is to give everyone credit for posting information about the access to and use of the data. Spiro, do, does that make sense to you? Not to put you on the spot, but putting you on the spot. I'm pleased to be put on the spot and I'm actually making a couple of notes here on what you just said. Uh, I invest, I spend 20% of my budget on data products every year. I do not know the value of these data. Okay, it, they're publicly, they're public assets. I'm not gonna stop doing it. But you know, how much value does it really add to our understanding? How much value does it add to the community? Because I see them as investments. And uh, you know, and before I finish this job, I'd like to be able to take a crack at that. Um, these, this, the incentives are clearly important here. We do have a lot of researchers who just aren't in the practice of, of citing the data products that are used. I saw an example just yesterday. Um, we have problems with getting uh, folks who take grants and contracts and not, not sending that information back to us at times. You know, that's, that's kind of a, you know, a paperwork management problem we have. You'd think that would be easy, but, you know, frankly, I can't tell you how many publications have come out of all of our work because they just don't get centralized. So we need that kind of command. Uh, of the system in some way. The accessibility, the, you know, we, we have a trilemma. Access, accessibility, and confidentiality. Can't maximize all three, right? Something's got to give. And, you know, we're very cognizant. ERS is one of the 13 federal statistical agencies. We bear that burden with great pride and great care. Uh, and, you know, we're trying to negotiate this process of the whole federal statistical system is is really quite quite cognizant of the confidentiality issues because it kind of it gets to trust it's trust from the folks who provide data to us. There's also trust on the other end, folks who use our data that they trust that it's that it is reliable, that it is accurate, and uh, and that's kind of a, you know the foundational challenge of our of our time right now is rebuilding and maintaining that trust and how do we do that so julie if i might just answer one of the questions that gone on in qa and chat about dois for grants so um, crossref um, actually has an initiative going on right now where they're dealing with some of the uh, ngos as well as some of the us government agencies about just precisely that but we do need they do need more government agencies involved so I do encourage um, the agencies that are on this call today. And otherwise, you can reach out to me via chorus or, or look up um, crossref.org um, and get involved with that. Because the more IDs, persistent IDs, and this is important, persistent IDs that are out there vis-a-vis uh, -vis grants and vis-a-vis -vis also data sets, um, the data set ones are assigned um, from, as Julia mentioned, data site. Um, that allows for disambiguation to happen and also allows for persistence to happen. So, I mean, I'm not saying that all persistent identifiers need to be in everything, but they do make things better. I mean, even Google, who is usually says, oh, we don't need any additional metadata or DOIs. Every time they say that, we had actually noticed they really use them when they're there. So I do encourage people to push the use of persistent identifiers in all of the various different means, and also get involved with other initiatives, such as the grant uh, ID thing, 
over at Crossref. Okay, that's a great point. The, so the plumbing is in place. So it's a little bit, my example here is Steve Jobs, who just put all the pieces together to create the iPhone and think about how that transformed, or the iPod, think how that transformed how we um, access music, for example. Uh, you could imagine doing the same thing here. Uh, these are great comments in the chat. We are out of time, so we're going to have to hand it over to Nancy. We'll curate and respond to all of these um, comments and again, uh, get signed up for the, for the follow on conversations. Thank so you for a fantastic you. discussion. Okay, over to you, oh. Howard. Over to you, Nancy. So let me introduce Nancy for those of you who don't know. Nancy is the CEO of NAPAX Consulting. She's formerly uh, was the Chief Statistician of the United States, so, uh, co-chairing the federal data strategy and serving as a commissioner on the Bipartisan Commission for Evidence-Based Policymaking. Nancy? Thanks, Howard. Um, just bringing up the my video. So hopefully it will... I'll show up in a second here, but I'll- um, You're good, Nancy. Okay. So um, I will just uh, talk here. Why don't we go to the next slide? Okay, I, I don't see the speaker view, but um, okay. I'll just talk. I don't, I'm not sure I'm on screen, but I will talk anyways. Um, you are completely on screen. You're good. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so next steps. Um, I, I hope everybody is just as blown away as I am about the possibilities here. I mean, we've seen some actual demonstrations of um, how the data science community could come together and um, participate in this challenge and come up with a tool that is available now actually and works now and creates these incredible um, discoverability tools that allows the agencies and the researchers um, to really unlock knowledge, to unlock the value of the data um, and then come together in a community and a network to increase value and increase the use of the data and discover what's not being used that should be being used, which is as exciting as knowing what's being used a lot um, and help the agencies really get feedback from the user community um, about how their data are being used, where to make the next investments, how to improve discoverability. Um, and what we can see is that with the publishers coming together with the users, with the agencies who are producing these data sets, and then getting the institutions who are supporting the researchers to all come together, um, we can really accomplish a lot and move this forward. But we have to take action. It is really not enough to just say, oh, wow, that's a really cool tool. There it is out there. So what are the next steps? Well, we really um, have to start doing these pilot projects that can continue to demonstrate the value and that um, people who are here today, who are listening, who are engaged, uh, can start to participate in some of the pilot projects. I saw in the comments and in the Q&A, uh, just absolutely incredible um, ideas about how to move this forward. What are things that we could add? Um, can we move from the publisher database and expand to other types of data that are out there that uh, machine learning models uh, could be used on to get this same type of information? And how are we going to invest in a common machine learning model and collaborate on this so that we can put it together in APIs and have a multitude of ways of discoverability of seeing how the data are being used, different dashboards, depending on what your interest is. And I think we've seen that that can be done. So, um, you know, we've heard from USDA and from um, NOAA and from NSF and, um, 
I think we can really move forward to some possible concrete approaches to pr promote evidence and use. So if we're looking at USDA, um, you know, they demonstrated with that work cloud that you can see how important data sets have been used in a particular area. Um, we heard from um, Judy and the, the panel that consisted of the institutions and from the publishers that um, they want to work with the agencies. In particular, I think USDA can work with the land grant univer universities and start to see how the data are being used, where the gaps are, um, how researchers can connect better with the data that are there that they may not be aware of, and then um, start to give feedback to USDA in an interactive environment. I think with NOAA, you know, we've seen a lot of comments on um, sort of relevancy. How does this help? I think um, the, the ERS word cloud showed how uh, the urban rural designations have these far reaching implications. But I think the NOAA data, which Dan touched on, um, really is very important for looking at climate change and coastal community resiliency. Um, particularly in the Gulf Coast, where we've seen so many major weather events have a massive impact. So, you know, a, a potential thing that NOAA could do would be to connect up with those communities, um, with the researchers at the Gulf Coast universities, um, with the federal, state, and the local agencies, perhaps with other federal agencies that are providing services in those areas, um, and work with the publishers to have access to what research has been completed that could really contribute to that body of knowledge about how coastal communities can best respond to, um, and, and not only how they can best respond, but what is the impact across different communities when these weather events occur that affect um, health, that affect housing, that affect the economic well-being of different communities. And then um, following up on that, we've also seen how um, the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics at NSF um, is looking at innovation data, putting these dashboards together so we have a much better body of knowledge of what's happening with innovation, um, connecting that up. I saw a lot of people who wanted to connect up um, information with grants, what are grants doing, and um, looking at representation of women and minorities in science research also has a connection to where are the grants going, who's getting them, how are they being used, um, who's publishing from those grants, um, and what data are they using? I think all of those things can really come together. And um, in order to come together though, most effectively, what has to happen really um, is to um, bring the community together. Um, so the ask here is for you to stay engaged, to stay involved, to not just you know, put your comments in the Q&A or in the chat, and go away, but really become part of this community, whether you're a publisher, whether you're a researcher, whether you're from an agency, um, whether you're from a research institution, or um, I see some of you are from um, NGOs and nonprofits who really care about um, policies that are based on evidence and on research and on the science. And um, you've got to stay engaged. And, and be involved in this. And I think that there is um, a really important component to the interaction here. Um, it, it can only get better with the interaction, with the network, with the constant dialogue and um, growth and additions to um, this, which is just a gift to everyone. Um, it's there, you could start using it um, it works and it needs improvement. So that needs constant engagement. And I, I think if you can fill out the survey and um, you know, if you've got an interest in any of these pilot projects, if you're from an agency and you're interested um, in another pilot project, 
Um, I think we would love to know that. Um, and Coleridge can come and talk to you and you can really learn more about how to um, sort of get this data around your own data sets um, and start to put the dashboards together. And I will say based on the experience that we've observed, just as an aside, although this is a key point, it's not very expensive to put the dashboard together. Once you um, sort of connect up and decide what you're going to do, um, it's kind of very, um, not technically difficult, I guess I would say, to, to actually start using the dashboards and to use some off-the-shelf software to create the visualizations off of the API to see how this is being done. So I really encourage you again um, to stay involved and um, to keep talking to us and um, think about how you can contribute to this effort because this is really a joint effort in the public good. We're all here because um, we care about the public good. It's, and, and we really want to advance the use of these data. Um, so with that, I think for some last words, I'll just turn it back to Julia. Um, if there's any last things that you want to add or Howard that you want, would like to add. Yeah, just first of all, or, or any last thoughts from the agency? We, well. we have some last thoughts from the agencies, Howard. Okay, we'll just put it out here. Go ahead. I'm happy to go first, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, go ahead, Dorothy. Um, again, I'm National Science Foundation, and uh, this is a thrilling initiative. Um, we were very happy to be a part of this conversation and we do look forward to further pilots, discussions uh, back at NSF and within NCSES. Thank you guys so much uh, for uh, your inspiring work. Spiro? Yes, again, thank you very much. We were very impressed with the, uh, with the whole project. Uh, we look forward to making great use of the tool. Uh, lots of interdependencies out there between what's going on with showing us the data, uh, as well as what kind of work we're trying to do in the Evidence Act uh, right now. So uh, we think there's tremendous potential. We look forward to being you know, engaged in this more deeply in the near future. Thank you. As Tom, I just want to weigh in as well. Uh, you know, I really like this public-private partnership uh, engagement. So, <clears throat> you know, we, we, we certainly look forward to more events and, and more of a, a collaboration and community practice and working groups uh, when it comes to these kind of efforts. So um, honestly, we're, we're really excited to build on this. So thanks again, everyone. Okay, thank you so very much um, for all the hard work and um, amazing panels. So um, very much look forward to following up. Thank you. With that, we'll close. And thanks everyone for attending today. Hope you learned a lot.